Welcome everyone to uh, the webinar for using BioLucida Cloud for creating and utilizing educational material for medicine and science. Before we jump in, I'll just throw a few technical notes out at you. This will be recorded, um, so and everyone will get a link that they can use to watch afterward if they want, if they miss anything. Um, type questions into the question window that's in the uh, GoToWebinar dialog, and uh, all questions will be answered. Uh, if they're not answered today in the webinar, um, they'll be on our website. So there will be... Um, an answer eventually. My name is Nathan O'Connor and I am the product manager here at MBF Bioscience for our BioLucida Cloud product. Uh, it's my, my sincere pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Bob Ogilvie. Uh, he's going to be accompanying on this, us on this webinar. Um, Dr. Ogilvie is a professor emeritus of the Medical University of South Carolina and a visiting professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of South Carolina. Bob's been teaching medical histology for over 40 years, um, and he's also the editor of the book, Virtual Microscopy and Virtual Slides and Teaching, Diagnosis, and Research. Um, and, is, and currently, in his role as visiting professor, he and his colleague, Dr. Roger Sawyer, have together, they have developed and teach uh, together a fully online histology course for upper-level college and grad students uh, at the University of South Carolina. So Bob's really been a great source of guidance, I just have to say this, um, for us as we've developed BioLucida. Uh, we really have loved his insight, and I, I, know, I know everyone attending will too. Um, I also mentioned that Bob's going to be speaking. Uh, we're going to be ex attending later this month Experimental Bio in Boston, and Bob's going to be speaking at a special symposium, the 125th Annual Meeting of the American Association of Anatomists. Um, and here's a little bit on that. There's, I think, uh, right, Bob? Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, the symposium is scheduled for Monday afternoon, night, April 22nd, and the title of the symposium is uh, Teaching Histology, Past, Present, and Future. It's actually being advertised as a refresher course sponsored by both the American Association of Anatomists and uh, MDF Bioscience. And you can see here there are three speakers, uh, one uh, from the uh, University of Virginia, Dr. Robert Bloodgood, is going to give a history, and Dr. Helen Amaranikon is going to give University of Arizona to give us the current challenges of teaching histology in the integrated curriculum, and she'll talk about some opportunities. And then I'm going to come on, and my talk will include our first experience in using BioLucida Cloud to instruct and test with virtual slides on the way to replacing our many years of using Neuroformatica. Great. And finally, we're going to be free of Java, which I'm yeah. extremely excited about. And yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that too in a bit. Um, so today we're going to cover basics. We're going to start with a very basic thing, just how do I do, how do I view my virtual slides in BioLucida Cloud? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how it's structured and fits into, fits into a uh, college. Um, and then we're going to go into creating examples of educational material in, um, in BioLucida and how that integrates into course management software like Blackboard as well as um, how you can limit some software functionality. Let's get started. Uh, I'm going to jump in. We're going to. I'm going to fire. I'm going to call up my viewer here. Um, and so this is this is what BioLucida looks like when you start it up as an as an educator. Uh, you're going to see a series of thumbnails, and what they correspond to are the directories that are in your server. And so what I'm doing is I'm clicking on uh, directories that are actually on my server. This this place called Track Directories. This is how you now. It's a view into your BioLucida server. Um, it's how you navigate through. And so if you have directory structure on there, like subdirectories, nested subdirectories, you're going to see exactly that here. Um, the only thing is it will present you with all of your thumbnails for your virtual slides. So you'll navigate to where the slide is that you want to go to, and then you're going to go in and actually click on that. I'm going to click on the thumbnail. Before I do that, I'll, I'll just say a couple things. Um, as I'm going through here, you notice I have this, this window popping up. Um, and it's telling me what the sample is, its dimensions, the objective that I used, and the, the size of the file itself. Um, I can also make the thumbnails larger, if that's useful to me. Uh, the other thing that I do have is this thing called a detailed view. And in there, um, I can see, um, for instance, on a couple of these, um, I have all of the names in there, but I also have uh, these things we call tags, and I can use tags to, to further organize my specimens, and if I have time at the end, I'll show a little more about that. But the basics of just how do you view the images um, is you click a thumbnail for an image that you'd like to look at, 
Um, and you can do all the basic things like move and scroll. Um, by default, when this comes up, you'll see pretty much it, when you open a window for the first time on BioLicity, you'll see this. Um, and it will be uh, the image area itself, some information on the image over on the right, and then up at the top, a macro view. Uh, the basics of viewing are you can use the arrow keys to move around your specimen. Uh, you can also grab and drag to move around with the, with the mouse button. Um, I can also zoom with the mouse wheel. And I, uh, if I want to as well, I can zoom using, I can go to a set zoom level, for instance. Go, go up to 100%, great. Yep, so that's where we are right now. And I can also, um, the other thing that I can do here is, so that's, that's zooming via the mouse wheel or this little magnification icon. Or in the macro view, um, I can click around there. And so what's this macro view? This macro view is, is an image of the entire tissue at once. And I can use that. I can click on that and just move around that area. Uh, the other thing that I can do that I'll mention, and I'll do this with the, um, with the mouse wheel, um, is if I'm out here and, you know, I'm panned off a little bit and I want to scroll in exactly to this is what looks like this eyelet to me here. I can put my mouse over that and move the wheel, and it'll keep that feature in the same place. So by doing that, what I can do is I don't have to pan and zoom and zoom and pan. I can actually just zoom to the exact location I'd like to be in. So that's a handy feature. That, together with the macro view, makes navigation uh, pretty easily. Uh, I can click anywhere in the macro view, and I'm immediately at that location on my slide. It's a very nicely preserved and stained pancreas. Mm, yeah, it, it's, it's a very nice specimen. Um, the other thing I'd say um, is we can indeed view more than one image at a time. Um, so, and the way I'll do that here is let's jump into this pathology directory here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click on a couple things. This one says it's normal human kidney. Um, and let's see, maybe I have one. Yeah, I've got a renal cars carcinoma, renal cell, um, renal cell carcinoma. Um, so I've put check boxes on both of those, and I'm going to open them. Um, so you can see they're both open, and I can view them in tab view. Uh, so that's the default way. When you open multiples, it's going to open up multiple tabs. The other view that I have available to me is um, I can put it in this thing called grid view or comparison view. And when uh, that's... Um, when that's in that mode, my browser window, which was a tab with all my thumbnails in it, is now a separate window. And I don't have it here in the webinar, but one really useful thing is all of these windows can be detached and moved to their own real area of real estate. So what I usually will do is I'll have my imaging area on one monitor and then have all my dialogues on another. Um, and so that as an instructor, as you're creating this educational material, you can kind of control the real estate, um, which is most in the way that you like for uh, um, putting your material together and seeing what you're doing. Uh, anyway, back to this. Um, so I've got these two images here, and I've got them at the same zoom level. And I, now what I'm going to do is lock them and when I, or synchronize them. And when I synchronize them, it will actually zoom in uh, on both of them. And it will also pan both of them as well. So it's useful for comparing, you know, in this case, uh, um, histology to pathology. Um, it's also useful if you have adjacent serial sections with different preparations. Uh, it's useful for that as well, or even similar preparations. Um, and the neat thing is, I mean, we're, we're pushing image, you know, lo rather large image data um, simultaneously over, over a network. So um, this, is, this is pretty cool. You know, what about the different, uh, you know, if people have uh, specimens from different scanners, what about that? Do you Handle yes, those? that's absolutely, that's a great question. Uh, we handle a lot of image formats, uh, including, you know, the standards like TIFF, JPEG, and, um, and various, from various confocal units as well uh, for supplemental research data. But um, those formats aren't necessarily great for virtual slides because they only handle up to a certain size. So, you know, all these, all these scanners tend to have their own formats. Uh, we support um, as many as we can, like for instance, the scanning formats from Zeiss, Olympus, Hamamatsu, uh, and Aperio, obviously. I don't know if some people have seen, but these are all SVS files. Um, and so we, we support that format as well. Okay, well, that's very good. And then that's how you can view. But uh, so what about uh, 
how is BioLucid uh, structured? Uh, is it a server? It is a viewer. Uh, do, you, do you need to purchase cloud space? Can you uh, elaborate on that? Please? I can. I actually have a diagram here. Um, and it's of a typical um, BioLucid implementation. Uh, at the top, I have a cloud, which is, in, you know, it, that's a buzzword today, and it's pretty, a pretty nebulous term. Here it just means where you're keeping your virtual slide collection, where, where that collection of slides lives. Um, and that cloud usually consists of a piece of hardware or, or virtual hardware, a server, and the BioLucid server software itself. Um, so that BioLucid server is the software component that manages the access, the viewing, the annotation and organization of your virtual slides. It, it serves as a single central repository for a collection of virtual slides that educators and students, if you've given them permission, have access to. Um, it's the piece of, of the BioLucida system that coordinates, for instance, uh, when hundreds of students access the same virtual slide at the same time. Um, and an advantage to that is that you end up, you know, these virtual slide um, collections can be big, like well over 500 gigabytes, um, and so you only need to, with the, under this type of architecture, you only need to maintain one copy of your slides. Uh, everyone can have their own copies uh, of each slide, but they're, they're not really copies, they're just references to the original slide, and, and it's BioLucid that actually manages that and then keeps it uh, looking for the individual user like it's their own copy of the slide. Uh, the other component of the BioLucida is um, the viewer, and that's what the students at the bottom of this diagram, what the students and instructors are using to access uh, the BioLucida server. Uh, it's also the component that the uh, instructors will use to grant or remove permissions uh, for student access to both images and software features. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned servers. Uh, is there one type of server configuration preferred? Uh, you know, we're flexible with BioLucido. Uh, we've made it so you can integrate the server with your uh, organization's existing IT or IS infrastructure. Uh, we can also supply you with server hardware, or uh, we can offer a true cloud solution that will use server space that we have that's outside of your organization. The, really, though, the most frequent thing that we've done is schools have tended to want to integrate BioLucido into their existing technology um, that their IT people provide. Uh, and we work with them to make sure it's it's the correct technology for BioLucida. Now it has its pluses doing it that way. Just as a, for instance, you if you have a hardware failure in, in a server, you have uh, a direct person right on campus who's going to take care of that. Um, so you're being taking people care of people right on your campus. But then, what kind of platform? I like you know, PC, Macintosh. Uh, what what kind of yep. platform does uh, BioLucida run on? So for the, ser for the server uh, portion, we, we support both uh, Linux and Windows. Uh, one, one nice thing that makes BioLucida kind of flexible from the IT side is we've done a lot of ex uh, installs and extensive testing on uh, virtualized servers. Um, and what that means is in things like VMware's uh, cSphere, that, that gives IT the ability to partition off a piece of their server as an as a virtual machine and just dedicate that to BioLucida and it doesn't have you know so that's that's some isolated machines just for BioLucida um, so it really offers IT some flexibility in terms of getting this thing integrated and up and running on the the viewer so the other piece of BioLucida the BioLucida viewer runs on Mac and Windows um, and it'll soon be on iPad too yeah I mean the in North America the, the viewer was all embedded within the server software but this is different that that's right software. So we, we have a client application that is the viewer, and the reasons are that are something that you alluded to before. Well, one is we, we're not, you know, um, we're not held kind of, um, we don't have to deal with the idiosyncrasies of various uh, web browser platforms, but most, no, most beneficially we no longer have to deal with Java and any changes in Java, um, which we had no control of. You know, they could release an update and literally the server the older technology than Neuroinformatica could potentially stop working based on what Java did to their software. And so we're, we're free of that now. Um, and we, you know, we control and design the software. So that's good. By be, right. By being free of uh, Java, uh, that's how you were able to do it on the iPad. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, the, other, that's the other part of that that's upcoming. So, so uh, Nate, that covers the basics of viewing images and the server and configuration of client, but why don't we talk about how you can use custom organization of slides to create education material. I mean, 
Uh, how do you approach organization of all those collections or the track directories you have in, in, on the server? Yeah, you bet. There's a, we, there's a couple routes to create material. Let me get back to BioLucida here. So I'm going to leave this comparison view that we were in before. Uh, we have a close all button, so if you have a lot of things open, you can close them at once. But I'm back in kind of my, my, file, my file view here, and I, I see some thumbnails in front of me. Um, one method of creating the material, one kind of flow, so to speak, is that you work through all of your, your slides, uh, accessing them off the server and you annotate and bookmark them there and I'll get to what those are in a minute um, and then you copy them into presentations the other method is you go through and you uh, decide all of the images that you want to present and you copy those into a collection and then in your own personal collection as a user you annotate them there they can always be shared later but that kind of keeps this the things that are in your track directory is pure that way, you know, um, and you don't have to worry about other people needing them and to delete your work. So we're going to today do it uh, that way. We're going to create a collection of images that we want to present, and then we'll annotate them and bookmark and share them. Um, so let, first, let's um, jump into actually making a collection. You can see down here I've got a couple already. I'm going to make a new one, and we'll call that uh, Histopath 303. Just to be consistent with that, what I've got there. And so now I want to move some images in there. Let's go up to our histology one and we'll move uh, maybe this, this thymus and this eye and then our nice uh, pancreas. So I check off the images that I want to move and I'll actually drag that down to my new collection. And when it does that, notice that, and this is one way, so in that first uh, method that I talked about wherein um, you actually do uh, make all your annotations on the things that are on the server. Uh, you can copy those to your new collections, or you don't have to. Here we're going to do our own once they're in our collections before we share them. And so I'm just going to copy the images in. And now when I do that, those thumbnails are there already. If you notice too, I didn't, I gave, I didn't give this quite the right name. So I'm going to go and actually edit that collection. And so I'm going to change the name of that. And we'll come back to this dialogue too, because this is the actual dialogue that you use to control um, whether the students can see this particular collection or not. So I've got three images in there now. Let's let's add a couple more. Maybe we'll want to add in. Um, what do we have here? Some. What do you think? Liver, and then um, cirrhosis liver. And I'll drag those down to histopath three. And I'm not going to copy any bookmarks or annotations here. So now I've copied a few images that I want to use in our study guide uh, into this new collection. Let's let's annotate a few of them now. Now you copied a few images and you're going to use them in the study guide, but uh, can you now describe bookmarks and annotations? Annotations are really a, a way to convey information uh, directly on the virtual slides themselves. They're a set of drawing tools. Um, for delineating uh, areas and regions and labeling cells and anatomic features. So here, I'm going to go to one of my other ones where I've actually uh, done one of these already. Um, and you see this little yellow dot. You can usually see them even at low zoom. Um, if I go in here, I've got an example of Hassel's corpuscle um, here in this particular slide. Um, and in, in the other one, let's see how to actually make a couple of those. So let's go back to our histopath. So the, I'll get to what bookmarks are in a minute, but the annotations are, are really the way that you convey um, information right on the slide itself. Um, so let's um, go in and let's take our, so I'll go to this eye and then I'll say, so I'm going to zoom into the area I want to be in. And let's just to show you the text facility, I click on this little hand with the, with the pencil on it. I'm going to detach this again so that I can see uh, the entire dialogue. And again, I would probably have this off on a second monitor. So let's make some text. I can pick the color, the font. I'm going to use black for black on black and white will be very apparent. Uh, you can pick the style and then you can pick the font size as well. So pretty much you'll just click anywhere and let's let's make one for, uh, I don't know, conjunctivitis or <laughs> conjunctiva. And then we can make another one for cornea. And then we can make maybe another one for iris here. And as I do that, uh, what I can do is I can move those around. I could change the spelling if I needed to. Put them maybe a little somewhere a little more appropriate here. Uh, and then I'll just give it 
a label of I. Uh, that, that the student doesn't see. That's from my own my own bookkeeping. But the text the students actually see. So here now I'll actually be able to describe to you the difference between um, uh, actually what a bookmark is. So I've got these these annotations on here, but let's say I want to show an overview of this particular area that I'm in. So I'm going to put it in a region that I like and I'm gonna say bookmark that and that bookmark is gonna just save this particular location in this virtual slide that happen to have annotations in them. So I have uh, regions of normal um, I and I think this is actually the species is undetermined on this. Uh, So let's say we want to have a close-up of, of this particular region. I'm going to make a bookmark there now as well, and I'll call that uh, normal conjunctiva. And done. And then let's go back out, and we'll go into the iris here. And I'll bookmark that as well. And, you know, I could also, these, these will be uh, presented to the students, so they'd be able to see them. So I could make this, you know, I could put something here like question three, for instance. This can be any text that I want that you'll be presenting uh, to the student later on. Uh, but usually what I'll show you in a little bit is how you export uh, hyperlinks to these so that you can integrate them in your educational software. Uh, so normal iris. So what I have with when this is done is in this one slide now, I have my overview. I can and I can step through these different regions. So bookmarks really are just like saving the locations. Um, and what I can do here is let's go and recreate um, in our own collection now. Uh, let's find one of those core puzzles and annotate that and bookmark it. And I'll show you another way you can do this a little more directly as well. So I, let's create a, a contour around this. And you can see what I'm doing right now is I'm creating a contour that's filled. Um, I, have to I have to change that. Um, so I'm going to close that. Let's edit that and make it so that it's not filled. And the other thing that we can do, and we'll make it dashed, is we can change this once we've drawn it so that it's, it meets what we want it to be a little more. Yeah. Okay, so then we're going to call the tassels core, core puzzle. puzzle. Okay, great. Um, well, what I have the one thing I want to show you here is the ability to as you you can you can actually have a bookmark created as you're creating these um, annotations as well. So there's a little checkbox here that says create that, and then the bookmark text is actually going to become whatever that description is. So when I say done now, uh, I have my of course my annotation list is going to be there in case I want to delete it or change its visibility. Um, but also where it went is so I've got all of my other <laughs> bookmark windows here. Let's move this over here to the side um, so that I can step through the image like I have been. But now there's that other one from that other image. So I've got this list of bookmarks now uh, and they're all taken from these these slides that are in this collection Histopath 3 that I made. So you can see I have all of these other from Histopath 2 and Histopath 1 I have these other organizations of bookmarks. Um, and what I can do is, if I if I want to, um, and so that's how you would go about organization organizing uh, classes, for instance. Uh, you put all of your slides in a class, go through, annotate, and create bookmarks, and then you have that collection. Um, the one thing, the only other thing is I'll mention is, let's say I wanted Hassel's core puzzle above before we even looked at any I. So now, in my list, that's first. So you can rearrange these. Now that's that's the only other thing that I'd point out here. Um, that's really the flow of things here. Um, so basically, you, mm -hmm. what you've done, as I understand it, you've you've taken from your uh, the overall directories that you have on the server, and you've made some co special collections. You've copied them in there. Yep. And then you've uh, uh, annotated some specimens, and then saved those magnifications and locations by bookmarking. And that's exactly right. And then these bookmarks are what I now that I have my list and I've got everything this, this is you know as an example what I would want to show to someone I can share them um, and so I'll click on them and I'll click share and when I do that that's actually copied right into um, my uh, my clipboard and I can paste that into other applications 
Now that's a URL, right? That's a URL. That's right. Um, yep, exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, so t I could take that and um, integrate that into, you know, any. I could put it in Word. I could put it in uh, an HTML document. I could put that hyperlink into something like Blackboard. Um, so and into a question, right? And into a question, exactly, exactly. Awesome. So let me show you how that um, how that works. Um, yeah, yeah. How how do you uh, actually present these bookmarks to a student, and how can you control the functionality of what a student sees? One of the things we need to do first is make sure that the student. I'm going to close this window now. Can actually see see the um, the uh, the bookmarks. So we have to give them access to that collection. So as a for instance here, I, I have a student account on here already. Uh, we are right now logged on as educator, and you can always tell who you are by looking at the top here or my mouse is it says connected to MBF Shuttle 01 educator uh, as an educator. Um, and so if I go and I edit this collection, when I do that, you can see it's a private collection, meaning I, it's my collection and I'm the only one who can see this right now. So what I have to do is I have to attach a, a student to that. And so I'm going to, there I am, there's another user, there's the BioLucid administrator. So I'm going to give the student view access. Uh, and you can give them other types of access. Um, typically for a student, though, you'd give them view. But if it were a collaborator who you wanted to make changes to your annotations or something, you would make them either full or maintainer, either one of those. Uh, but we'll make the student view. Okay. And now, uh, now what I'm going to do is, if you recall in that bookmark list, I could see I could see all my classes, basically. I could see Histopath 101, Histopath 202. Um, maybe I don't want the student to see those. So let's go in and make sure that when I log in as a student, I'm not going to see those. So I'm going to actually remove the students, and the student's not on Histopath 101. Uh, and the student uh, is on Histopath 202, so I'm going to get rid of that and save. And now it's time to let's actually log in as a student and, and grab one of these hyperlinks and, and paste it from, let's paste it from a web browser. Um, um, so I'm going to grab this corpuscle one, and I'm going to say share. That gets copied into my thing. The only thing I need to do now is is make sure that, because uh, when this fires up next time, it'll log in as whoever was on last. So I'm going to jump to my student account, and then get off of here. And then let me uh, fire up a a new window. Uh, and this is this is equivalent to clicking a link in Blackboard, for instance. So uh, I'm going to enter that URL into my web address, and immediately that pops up right to this right to this particular bookmark that I want. Um, and so if there were any if there were any text in there, I would see it because I'm, I'm bookmarked at that particular area of the annotation. Uh, and sure enough, in my student view, I don't see Histopath 101 or or uh, 202. The other thing that I'll show here is that um, you can limit what they see in this. So in this particular student view that I have set up, and we'll go over this in a second, um, I, don't, I don't want them going back to that server view at all. I don't want them having to see thumbnails. I want them basically to have the software open up exactly to, to the image that I want them to see. But they still have the tools, like in the magnification box, they can select different magnifications if you haven't uh, blocked that, right? Yep, that, that's right. Um, let, me, uh, let me go back, let me jump back and I'll show you one thing. Um, is I'm going to go back to my educator account. Um, and if I go in there, and let's say now I go back to my histopath. Let's say now on this, on this Hassel's core puzzle, I click that lock button and now I share it. Now when I go back into the student view, and I enter a hyperlink again, now when you're in these hyperlinks, if you put those in Blackboard, they're just links that the yep. link, and then you just a student will click on that and just open up automatically as long as the BioLucifer viewer client has been installed. That's right. That's right. So usually the first thing they'll do is, you know, before you even start classes with them, they'll install this viewer, and then they're, they're good to go. But if you notice now, I'm clicking and dragging, and I'm trying to zoom, and I can't because that bookmark, when I shared it, 
I, I click that lock symbol on it. So if you wanted that's to like a static photo micrograph. Yep, that's exactly right. That's the same. That's exactly the same same concept. It's a, we just kind of built that into here, so that you right. wouldn't have to export a picture to um, to uh, Blackboard. Now, so I'm going to go back here. Um, and you know, again, as the administrator, I, or my instructor view, I can see all of my all of my bookmarks. Um, but I want to show you now um, how you can uh, lock down some of that functionality. So um, we went over, you know, how to control what courses or what collections the students can see. But how do I control, for instance, if they can get to this browser um, or other functionality? And that's that's a concept of of workspaces. Um, and so I'm going to jump into what's called the administrator. Uh, this is just look, admin drop down, and I'm going to go to users. So you could have a workspace for students, a workspace for a colleague, exactly, a, right? A workspace for a technical assistant or whatever. Yep, that's right. And here's um, and I'll go there now. So I'm going to go uh, back here to my home, and I'll show that to you. And I'll go to save a workspace. So right now, if you notice, I have no images open, and that's usually the way you want to do this. So I'll go tools, save workspace, and here's all the things that I can control. Um, I'm making a new one, so I'll give it like, I think I've made a few of these, so I'll make it student view four. Um, do I want them to be able to navigate to this web browser? Um, do I want them to be able to load files from their hard drive? No. Uh, do I want them to be able to save their own workspaces? Probably not. Uh, I'm assuming, you know, the most restrictive roles that I can. Do I want them to be able to use the next and previous image buttons to navigate through image collections? No, I want them basically to go to the image that I, I want them. If this were a collaborator, you'd probably have most of these checked, except maybe loading files from their hard drive or something like that. Or, or let me just say that if you were creating not a quiz for a student, but you created a lab lesson, you could have a whole series of bookmarks with annotations in them, and then uh, you could allow them to navigate uh, all through those bookmarks and next and previous slides, and they could do their lab work. That's right. For a study guide, you might have this enabled, right? Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah, but for here, I'm just going to leave them all unchecked, and then I'll say done. And then under that user administration, once I've set that up, I can go into any user I want, really. Uh, here I'll go into the student, uh, and here's by the way how you how you would you know uh, change things like the passwords on your students and that sort of thing. But the only thing I'm really going to do right now is put on one of my works my workspaces. So that imposes all those criteria on onto that user. They can no longer do all of those those tasks that I unchecked. Um, and it, that's really it. That now that user, whenever someone called student logs in, they're only going to be able to pretty much just go exactly to the links that I send them from Blackboard. So that's that's really um, limiting the functionality. Uh, that's you know creating the hyperlinks that you can export and then limiting the functionality or, or the student experience to exactly what you want it to be. Um, so they wouldn't be able to get to that browser or open local slides. They're only going to be able to get to the bookmarks that, that you explicitly send them to and gave them permission for. Um, that's the kind of the entire process of getting links to regions of virtual slides that you can use them in something like Blackboard. Uh, just kind of to recap, we created a collection, put some images in it, annotated and bookmarked, and then basically went through and shared those links after, after we uh, assigned students to it and said this is the functionality that the student can get at. Bob, I was, um, I actually, um, that's how you create some of this uh, educational material. We've got some time. I was wondering if, if you wanted to talk about um, maybe your experience with, uh, you know, um, glass versus slides or actually, um, you know, the quality of learning. Are, is using virtual slides as good as glass slides, for instance? Do they learn as much? So I don't know where you want to pick it up at. Uh, it's very difficult to totally replace the use of a glass slide microscope, but we teach large number of students. And for example, at the University of South Carolina, in this uh, histology course from biological sciences, we have this semester 200 students. We have at least 150 each semester, and it's totally online. And so uh, this is a very efficient way to teach microscopy. And um, for instance, at NUSC, uh, for 
the integrated curriculum in histology right now, they're, they're used in Norflamatica and they're using virtual slides in the classroom and the lecture and, and giving tutorials, but they still test on the on still and captured images. And the Department of Pathology there, uh, they made a transition in three years with my help in the cases where we, they now all have virtual slides with uh, with areas in, in questions and annotations to help the tutorial leaders to be efficient in their approach. And uh, But with the complication of Java, it's really been frustrating. So I'm extremely excited about uh, being able to adopt BioLucida, and we're just beginning of that. One of the students that took my first online course from the University of South Carolina in spring 2011 eventually became my TA, and she's been with me for uh, five semesters. This is actually our sixth semester of teaching, and uh, but that summer she was hired by the Department of Pathology at the University of South Carolina to create virtual slides, actually using the DACO instrument, kind of a proprietary way, but they were trying to save money, and she's done a good job with this. But early on, that very summer, one of the pathologists worked with her and said, you really know histology. You must have had a good, very good histology course. Well, hmm. the student took the course online. The student had never used a microscope and glass slides to study any histology, only online using web mic and the virtual slides. So I think that tells you something about the quality possible. And if a student hmm. is serious, I do believe they can learn histology in this way. That's great. Uh, it sounds like a good case study you had there, especially with your student. Um, how do you actually create users? Uh, so again, I'm going to go to BioLucida as, as someone with administrative privileges, and I'm going to go Admin, Users, and I'll click on Add User. Um, one thing I'd point out, and you're going to give it a username, a first name, a last name, an email, um, a lab, which would be basically be um, your, your class. Um, and then you're going to specify whether this new user is a viewer or administrator. Again, we saw that you can apply these, these workspaces to, to restrict access to various parts of the software. Um, and then a password. And you can make that visible for yourself as, a, as an admin. Um, the one thing I would mention here is that if you had pointed the BIOS of the server when it was being installed on the server, or more accurately, your IT folk had, um, and us working together had, um, and you had LDAP groups, um, th this would be populated with users. And what you could do is you could select multiple uh, users at a time and and basically edit various aspects of them. Um, but yeah, I, but so that's it's pretty simple to create a user. Um, it's just a dialogue and or pointing the, pointing the uh, BioLucida server, uh, having your IT point the BioLucida server at an LDAP group. The specific BioLucida formats that we're supporting um, and that again is JPEG 2000, uh, JPEG itself, uh, Aperio's SVS, the NanoZoon or NDPI, uh, TIFF files, Olympus OIB, OIF, and VSI, uh, FlowView TIFF from Olympus, which is their confocal format, um, the Zeiss files for scanning, and as well as their LSM confocal files, uh, and the Leica LIF format. So we're at the end of our time for this webinar. I'm really thrilled that we've been able to show everyone BioLucida and some of its educational capabilities. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me directly if I can answer any, any questions. You have my, um, my uh, contact information in your email. Um, and I'd like to, again, extend a huge thank you to everyone attending and want to say how honored we are to have Dr. Bob Ogilvie here today with us. So thanks again, everyone, from MBF Bioscience.